Hello, my name is Nerida Campbell and I'm the Acting Head of Curatorial at Sydney Living Museums. Welcome to today's Discover SLM Talk and I extend a particularly warm welcome to our members, donors and supporters. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose land I live and currently work. I pay my respects to elders past, present and future. And as I hear the thunder rumbling overhead right now, I'm reminded of the power and beauty of country. Curators of SLM are constantly discovering new stories about the people, places and things we care for at our 12 sites. During this talk series, we have shared some of this research with you and we're going to end the series with a talk on Christmas in the colonies next week. Keep an eye on the Sydney Living Museum's website though for new curatorial programs next year. Today's speaker is Dr. Jackie Newling, who specialises in place-based social history and heritage, connecting the past with the present and bringing meaningful stories to contemporary audiences through various forms of media, from exhibitions to interactive opportunities. Jackie has a Le Cordon Bleu master's degree in gastronomy, and co-curated the Eat Your History, a shared table exhibition at the Museum of Sydney in 2013. She is the cook in Sydney Living Museum's food heritage blog, The Cook and the Curator, and author of the award-winning Eat Your History, Stories and Recipes from Australian Kitchens, which can be purchased online through SLM's website and makes a great Christmas present. Today, Jackie's, take, Jackie's going to take us below stairs at Elizabeth Bay House, which was constructed in the 1830s to discover the kitchen facilities and cooking technologies of the times. If you have a question for Jackie, add it to the Zoom chat and she will answer it at the end of this talk. Thanks, Jackie. Thanks so much, Nerida, and hello, everybody. I'm speaking to you today from Wongal country and I pay my respects to Australia's First Nations people and their elders past and present and emerging. The subject of my talk today is Elizabeth Bay House, which was built between 1835 and 1839 on Gadigal country. And I do have some slides, so I'm going to share my screen. And hope you're seeing what I'm seeing. Positioned below the sandstone ridge where Macaulay Street now runs through Potts Point, it was Elizabeth Bay House was home to Alexander Maclay, who arrived in the colony with his family in 1826 to take the position of colonial secretary. Built at considerable expense, the house was declared the finest in the colony. Many original features have survived the house's 180 year history, not least its fine joinery, grand staircase and elliptical domed ceiling. And despite encroaching suburban development, it still commands spectacular harbour views. The house is built on three levels in typical Georgian villa style. Uh, bedrooms and a small sitting room occupy the upper level uh, and the ground floor comprises an expansive library, uh, formal reception, dining uh, and drawing rooms in the front of the house and a less formal breakfast room. Rather than use the formal reception rooms, it was the breakfast room where the family spent much of their time. Capturing the morning light, it was cool in summer and easier to heat in winter. I worked as a guide at Elizabeth Bay House for many years, and I assure you, the house gets very cold. We can imagine the bre family breakfasting here, and until they were, uh, sorry, unless they were entertaining, it's likely that they took dinner here as well. Dinner was the main meal of the day, taken at lunchtime. Behind the elliptical saloon in the centre of the house is a service door that leads to the rear of the property, where a separate kitchen wing or service wing once stood. And it was in here where the household kitchen was built. We get an idea of the size of this service wing from this map from 1854. And it shows that it was really quite expansive. Detached kitchens are a common feature of colonial houses. The usual reason given for separating the kitchen from the main house is to protect the house from the risk of fire. But it was also a concession to the heat. As Clara Aspinall noted in her three years in Melbourne, 
kitchens are detached from the houses to keep the latter as cool as possible. The service wing was demolished in the 1920s to make way for a road and two blocks of flats. But it's life, life below stairs in the basement cellars that captures my imagination. The cellars at Elizabeth Bay House are highly atmospheric and evocative. They're divided into two distinct areas with no direct access between the two. On the northern side are the wine cellars, the realm of the master and the butler. They could be accessed via a, main, via a main stairway from the rear courtyard, but also directly from within the house, from a concealed set of steps that are now blocked off. The southern, southern side of the cellars is divided into spaces of a more culinary nature. Like the wine cellars, they're completely underground and stay very cool in summer, an essential characteristic before artificial refrigeration, which came later in the century. Windows and light wells allow daylight to come through and help with ventilation, but the southern aspect means the rooms are protected from direct sun and the afternoon heat. There's minimal evidence of these rooms' original functions, and it's impossible to know the extent of alterations made over the house's 180-year life. But the layout follows a relatively set pattern of culinary apartments from the Georgian period. Typically, a larder or meat locker and a milk room or dairy are located in the coldest parts of a kitchen complex, which in Australia is usually the southernmost spaces. The stone bench and bays in the corner room are typical fixtures found in a dairy um, from the early to mid 19th century. And it also makes sense that the milk room would be an easy access of the stairs. The family would have kept one or more house cows and buckets of freshly drawn milk would be poured into large shallow dishes, which being narrow at the base, allowed air to circulate between the bench and the sides of the dish, so the milk cooled quickly. Left on the bench to cool as warm air rises, it would be drawn up and out through the window and anything stored in the bays beneath would not be affected. Butter was made from the cream that rose to the top of the milk and the remaining skimmed milk was used for cooking or made into fresh cottage style or ricotta style cheese or yogurt. These products may have been stored in the adjoining room. Except for the, some markings on the walls that sh suggest shelving, there are no clues as to how this room was fitted out. It's also possible that this room was the larder as it was preferable for meat and milk to be kept apart to prevent cross-contamination, the room at the far end of the complex may have been the larder. The word derives from lard, meaning pork fat, and the larder was used for storing fresh and processed meat products. So it was more or less the sort of small goods section of a delicatessen. Although they were in close proximity to the Sydney markets, the Maclays kept rabbits in a specially built run. Many houses kept pigs and most certainly a range of fowl. Meats were preserved in a variety of ways, including terrine style brawn and jellied tongue, protected from the air by aspic. Cooked poultry could be blanketed in fat confit style and all manner of cooked meats were made into pate like potted pastes. Pork was cured to make bacon and hams or pickled by salting and storing it in vats of brine, as was corned or collared beef. Garden produce may also have been stored in the cellars, perhaps in the smaller room at the end of the corridor. The Maclays had an extensive kitchen garden and excess produce in season was kept for use in the coming months. Root vegetables, cabbages and cauliflower type hardy vegetables and fruits such as apples could be kept relatively fresh in tubs of sand. Buried beneath the surface, they are protected from the air and light, and sand inhibits further growth or sprouting and slows down decay. Any fresh produce that wouldn't store well was no doubt made into pickles, preserves and cordials. The cellars were probably too damp and musty to store dry goods such as rice and flour, bought in bulk, they were most likely kept in a store in the detached kitchen. So let's turn our attention to the large room in the middle. You can see by its shape that it is immediately below the breakfast room. 
The Western Wall features a fireplace and other infrastructure that are clearly remnants of a kitchen. But given that there was a separate kitchen in the service wing at the rear of the house, why was there a need to cook here? Basement kitchens were part of the standard building design for English houses at the time. And it made sense that one would be installed in Elizabeth Bay House. Because it was based on the sort of English design of architecture. But as there was this separate facility, it was believed for a long time that this infra infrastructure was not used. Scorching in the fireplaces and chimney and evidences evidence of old fixings on the side of the stonework, however, made me question this theory. It also seemed practical to me that a kitchen under the house would be useful in the wintertime to help warm the room above. I suspected this in my um, early stages of my gastronomic career. So to test my hypothesis, I needed some professional advice. I sent photos of the kitchen space to English food historian, Peter Breers, author of several culinary history books and consultant to various heritage museums in the UK. He kindly and generously wrote back, sharing his expertise in a detailed letter, complete with drawings of the types of fixtures, fittings and their functions that were typical of the times. Breers immediately recognized from the photograph that the wide fronted fireplace that we see here and sloping hood were added after construction of the house. It was built out into the room expanding on a small original fireplace which you see in the middle of the photo. If you look closely to the left of the fireplace you see that hood extends across a bricked in window. This suggests that the space was not originally as intended as a kitchen but that it was purposely fitted out despite the existence of the attached, sorry, detached service wing. It's quite common to see gaping fireplaces with large pots and boilers suspended from an iron bar or swinging arm to cook over an open fire. But Breers supposed that this fireplace was fitted with a more sophisticated iron range, similar to the one shown in this image from William Henderson's The Housekeeper's Instructor published in 1800. Now I'm gonna to refer to this image quite a bit um, as the Henderson illustration or drawing. And that gives you a closer look at the cooking facility. So ranges of this kind were used uh, throughout much of the 19th century, fitted variously with useful attachments and apparatus. The kitchen at Elizabeth Bay House had an oven fixed into the wall. So its range may not have included the little oven that you see to the left of the fire in this illustration. It was more along the lines of the setup shown here in a later trade catalogue from, uh, from 1862 um, in the Carolyn Simpson Library collection. These are smaller and quite compact versions, but you can see the water tanks at either side, which would be heated by the fire in the middle. They provided a ready supply of hot water and a flat warm surface on top to rest pots and dishes on. The size of the fire could be adjusted by sliding cheeks, so fuel wasn't wasted for small jobs. And note also on the top of the sliding cheeks, the trivet-like swivel plates that could hold a pot or a kettle over or away from the fire, eliminating the need to suspend pots directly over the flame. According to Breers, these simple but clever devices were certainly around in the 1830s. But the principal purpose of the open-faced fire was to roast meat. Most of us these days bake meat in the oven, but true roasting involves direct exposure to the fire, not necessarily the flame, but intense radiated heat generated from the fire. So as the Henderson illustration shows, meat was cooked in front of the fire, in this case on a spit rod. The fixings on the side of our fireplace suggest that spit bars ran across the front of the range in similar fashion. The Henderson illustration shows a jack mechanism attached to the chimney face and turns, uh, which turns the rods below. So the meat cooks evenly. 
It's difficult to determine whether the kitchen at Elizabeth Bay had this kind of apparatus, but a roasting jack survives in the kitchen of another house that once belonged to the Maclays, Brownlow Hill at Camden. So it's quite possible that one was in use here as well. Alternatively, a bottle jack could have been used, suspending the meat vertically rather than horizontally in front of the fire as shown here in this depiction of an Australian kitchen from a Mrs Beaton's book of household management from the 1880s. Bottle jacks were available in the colony from the 1820s, but my hunch leans more towards the more established and robust spit rod system in the Maclay's basement kitchen. Either way, both illustrations show a drip tray below the meat to catch drippings, which were used to baste the meat as it cooked. Potatoes, carrots and parsnips and Yorkshire style puddings could also be cooked in the hot fat as it was collected in the tray. The kitchen at Elizabeth Bay House um, featured an oven housed in a cavity in the wall next to the fireplace. Now we can see it's not a dome shaped uh, brick uh, beehive style brick oven um, or bread oven. Um, but it once this sort of cavity here once contained what was known as a pastry oven, basically an iron box. The oven was heated from a small fire set below, and you can see that area is now bricked in. The iron itself retained and provided ambient heat, but cavity, a cavity around the box allowed hot air to circulate and help create an even temperature, while a flue drew any smoke into the main chimney. Compact and quick to heat, these ovens were handy for baking biscuits, meringues, tarts and pies, scones and small cakes, custards and cheesecakes. I hope you've had your afternoon tea. We see also in the Henderson illustration, cooks tending a set kettle set into a brick uh, housing. So it's essentially what we would associate with a laundry copper today. The illustration shows a hefty cloth bound pudding destined for the copper and many people have memories of their grandmothers using the laundry copper to boil Christmas puddings. That's the subject of next week's talk. But lots of other foods were boiled, including meats such as ham, calves and pigs heads, tongues and large joints of meat. And except perhaps for corned beef, we've lost the appetite for boiled meat. Everything else is generally roasted or baked. There's no evidence of a set kettle in the Maclay's basement kitchen, but large cuts of meat could be boiled in cauldron-like pots suspended over the fire as shown in the illustration, if necessary. Peter Breers thought that the tall space to the left of the main fire might have contained a boiler of some kind, but the area is not very deep and there's no sign of charring on the stonework. So it's possible it was where wood was stored in easy reach to fuel the fire. Coal was commonly used by the 1830s in Britain, but firewood was still relatively plentiful in the colony. The brick structure on the far left, uh, topped with a sandstone slab, contains three holes, which you can see here. It was a stewing stove for frying, sautéing and cooking more delicate dishes. Each hole was fitted with what Breers likened to an upturned top hat with a grate at its base in which hot coals glowed or burned. These iron baskets could be lit from below or from embers from the main, or embers from the main fire could be shoveled into them for instant heat. Essentially, they're equivalent to our stovetop hob or hot plate. This image is from um, Jefferson's Monticello in Virginia in America. It's a uh, built in the 1920s. And you can see along the left um, a row of square stewing hobs um, that have remained in the uh, house, which is now a museum. And you can see at the far end is the set kettle built into the corner. There's no range in the fireplace, uh, but you can sort of see the um, the iron swing arm for large pots and sort of braces or dogs sitting at the bottom that would support the main fire. 
but note the jack on the wall and to the right, a large bricked in beehive bread oven. So you can see it's not dissimilar in a way to the style of the Elizabeth Bay House basement kitchen. So our ghost kitchen once had a stove, an oven, a spit and hot water tanks, allowing cooks to bake, roast, boil, poach, stew, braise, fricassee, saute, fry, jelly, and make stocks and sauces. It was mere steps away from cool rooms with meat, dairy, fresh fruit and vegetables, and perhaps a pantry of pickles and preserves. What more could you need to achieve this menu of over 33 dishes served over three courses? I won't read the full menu out, but you can take your time over that one. Um, <laughs> but there is one thing missing, and perhaps you can work that out. There's no evident place to wash up. Someone had to deal with all those dishes. Perhaps there was a scullery in the basement area, perhaps even in the kitchen itself. It's a large uh, space and there would have been um, enough room for a trough and a dish rack on the opposite wall to the um, cooking range. Uh, there would certainly have been a preparation table in the room. But regardless, it's clear that this was a working kitchen and at some stage at that hundred Sorry, at some, some stage of the house's 180 year old history, even if just in the winter time. And I'm wondering if anybody has fed in some questions. Thanks, Jackie. If you do have a question for Jackie, pop it in the chat now. I've got one for you though. How many people would have worked in a kitchen that size? Uh, there would have been a head cook, um, possibly female, but quite often male. And especially in the early years of the colony, um, there weren't a lot of women um, around. There were a lot more men than women. And so, um, Yes, it could have been. It could have been one or the other. Uh, we know that the Maclays, um, their house cost so much that it's it sent them into financial strife, <laughs> and so we know that their staff was predominantly uh, convict uh, convicts who who worked in the house. Uh, so there would have been a cook, and there would have been uh, certainly a kitchen maid, and probably a sort of lower level scullery maid who would have um, perhaps doubled up as uh, you know some of the household duties as well, helping the laun with laundry and things like that. But in the kitchen itself, I'd say two to three people to keep a, a, a large family going, um, plus many other servants to actually service the rest of the house. So no French chefs there? <laughs> no, I don't think so. We do know that um, that uh, when I think it was um, Sarah Wentworth uh, put on a ball, uh, she hired in a chef. So there were there were chefs you know chefs for hire uh, even if you didn't enjoy their services every day we've got a couple of questions for you in the chat katie asked would the kitchens at vaucluse house and elizabeth farm have been similar when their kitchens were first built perhaps that's elizabeth bay house not okay. elizabeth farm Oh, look, there is, a, there, is some, there is some evidence at Elizabeth Farm of um, when you visit the farm now and when you visit Elizabeth Bay House, you can see what's called a, a semi-closed range that do have the oven built into the fireplace. So they date to um, a lot later in the century. So, but you can see that they have been retrofitted. So both those kitchens, one dates to the 1820s, one dates to the 1830s, really did have that big, big open-faced fireplace at first, and then they were modified as time went on. And that's, you know, that's why it's so rare to find an original kitchen uh, in a colonial house, because, you know, because technology changes, they're often the first things that are renovated uh, when new technology comes in. You know, Hayley is asking, um, with the kitchen so far away from the dining room, how did they keep everything hot when they were serving the food? Now, that's a good question. Uh, there were often complaints. The style of dining meant that um, you would send up the all, pretty much all the dishes from a course. Uh, you might have seen that menu was divided into three courses. And that earlier illustration, um, the colour illustration showed that you have know, so much food like a banquet all on the table at once. So yes, everything did come up um, 
from the kitchen at once. It was all spread out on the table to look abundant and glorious. But by the time people sat down, and remember if you were having a formal dinner, that was quite a ceremony in itself, there was great complaint that the food was cold by the time people got to eat it. But there were clever little tricks. They would warm little brick tiles, for example, and sit them um, underneath. You'd have a dish within a dish. So the little brick tiles could sit um, between the dishes to keep a plate hot. Uh, and eventually when ice came in, you could do the same thing. You could sit a dish on ice, but we're, we were, it's a little bit early in 1830s for that to have been happening at Elizabeth Bay. Hey, uh, we've got another question. Did they have their own bakery or bread oven or would they have bought bread in from outside? So, um, you know, a house of this nature and, you know, we're sitting on quite a large estate, you know, several acres and certainly properties like um, Elizabeth, uh, like Vaucluse, um, they uh, would have bought, sorry, they would have baked their own bread in the early days, but as they became sort of more connected to the township, um, you know, um, then it became more common to, to buy bread. Um, but the, um, and that's, again, that's why it's even rarer to find a surviving bread oven on an estate because often those, those, those bakery spaces were dismantled um, as they became redundant. But you could still make things like soda bread and quick breads and things like that in those little pastry ovens. How long did it take someone to train to become a cook or a chef at this time? It's quite a complex process by the sounds of it. Have yes, you managed all that? Yeah, that's a really good question um, because there, there would have been formal cooking schools for chefs, for example, but that was usually on an, um, an apprentice sort of basis. So I, I mentioned Jefferson's uh, Monticello. He um, actually had a um, uh, one of his slaves, one of the part of his slave staff was um, his cook and he sent him to France or took him to France with him to learn to cook from French chefs. So it was definitely a skill that was passed on from other cooks as opposed to sort of, you know, going to a cooking school. Um, so people, you know, there, there was criticism, for example, of the Irish girls that uh, many of the Irish girls that were sent here and put into service because they would never have um, experience the sort of cooking facilities and the types of foods if they came from a lower socioeconomic background then it would have been a steep learning curve to have to learn how to juggle all these pots and all these different ingredients and all the all the timing for example to get a meal onto the table at, at the right time I think there's a lot of um, mums and dads out there who struggle with the same thing so <laughs> Yes, I was taught to cook um, by my grandmother on a cast iron stove and there's certain times of the day when the fire is at the right heat for cooking certain things. If you don't quite catch it, then your bread won't work or your scones will be too overdone or your meat won't cook in time. So certainly an art there. Well, that's all we've got time for today. Um, I invite you all to join us next week for the last in our series of Discover SLM talks for this year. And it was quite, um, quite interesting that you showed the pudding being cooked in one of your illustrations, Jackie, because that's what you'll be tackling next week, Christmas in the colonies and um, puddings in particular. So join us again next week at four o'clock for Christmas in the colonies with Dr. Jackie Newling. Thank you and enjoy your evening. Thanks, everybody.